This is a Veterans History Project oral history interview with Lieutenant Colonel David Landon. Today is October 10th, 2005. Mr. Landon, would you state your name and your date and place of birth? Uh, David Landon. Uh, I was born in Sugar Grove, Pennsylvania on October 12th, 1919. Do you call when did you graduate from high school, Mr. Landon? I graduated from high school in 1937. What did you do following high school? Uh, I went I went to business college for two years, and uh, uh, I worked uh, at a at a refining company in Warren, Pennsylvania, for that time also. Where is Warren, Pennsylvania, in Sugar Grove? Uh, Warren Sugar Grove is. Uh, right in the northeastern part of Pennsylvania, right by the line, New York state line. Um, Warren is 16 miles south of that. What were you doing again in Warren? I was, I was working for, with, for, with a for refining company, oil refining company. Where were you on December 7th, 1941, and what do you recall about that day? I was in, um, December 7th, I was in Camp Shelby, uh, which is outside of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, with 166 field artillery. I'm asking, I'm getting ahead of, me, ahead of you. Tell, tell me a little bit then, since you already were in the service, uh, tell me a little about how you came to uh, be called into the service. Uh, I was selected by Selective Service back in uh, 1941 uh, to do a year's duty with the service, uh, and I was uh, inducted on May 5th, 1941. I was sent to uh, the screening uh, area down in P Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and then from there sent to the field artillery in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, or Camp Shelby, now, now Fort Shelby. Were you aware that you were going to be inducted into the service? Uh, well, I wasn't. My mother thought I would never make it. I was, <laughs> so she, she was convinced that I would not physically pass it, and I, so I was I was aware for about a, a month that I was my, my number was up, but uh, she was convinced that, that my heart was bad and I wouldn't make it. I made it fine. <laughs> what what made her think that you weren't? I had been sick it? as an infant and I had a heart murmur, mm -hmm. and she was convinced that that would keep me out of the service. And it, it didn't. I went into service. Now, was were, were, was the induction statement to you? Was that because that it? A law had passed for a draft. Uh, that was a draft law. Yes, you're correct. There was a draft law, and uh, uh, there was a lottery, and uh, you, each person had a number, and uh, they were with a the lottery. They picked up numbers, and if yours came up, uh, you were given a physical, and if if you passed the physical, you went into service for one year. For one, that it was a one year commitment. For one year. Where, where did you go when you received your notification? How did you get that notification? I got that by mail uh, from the Selected Service uh, Organization. I forget the actual uh, correct name for it. Anyhow, I got that by mail and told me to report to Warren, Pennsylvania. Where is Warren? Warren is just uh, south of, uh, it's a county seat for the county that I lived in, south of Sugar Grove. And uh, then they put us on a bus. Uh, with, with others, probably 16 or 17 of us went to Pittsburgh to be screened and then sent to where we were to go. In Pittsburgh, what was this, where where exactly was where you screened, do you recall? It was just a temporary setup and I cannot, wasn't too familiar with Pittsburgh, I hadn't been there probably ever in my life before. And uh, it was a, a temporary a military establishment strictly to screen the uh, draftees when they came in. I'm curious, had you been, had you traveled very much prior to the induction notice? No. No. The, the, uh, the travel to, to Pittsburgh, the, was, the, were these with other boys from Warren County? Yes, yes. We were about 15 or 16 boys that were put on the bus and sent to Pittsburgh. Was there a specific age for induction? Because at this point I'm seeing you're probably about 22 years old or so. Uh, I'm not sure where it cut off, but I think it went up into the 30s, I think. Yeah. Like 35 or something like that. What was the youngest age? Maybe uh, 20? You're not sure if it, you're not even sure. You had to be it. out of high school. You had to be out of high school. Right. 18 or 19. And, and this is for a one-year commitment. Correct. 
So, and at this point, were you concerned that the U.S. was going to get into a war? Well, it began to look worse and worse, and uh, and then there were rumors that it, the commit would be commit our commitment would commitment would be extended, and then of course on December seventh, war was declared, mm -hmm. and I knew then that I didn't want to stay at the field artillery that I where I was in for the duration, and I decided I had to do something about it. Tell me again, what time of year in 1941 did you receive your induction notice? May f May first, 19. 41. May 1st. I'm sorry, May 5th. Excuse me, May 5th, 1941. So you went you went from from Warren County uh, to Pittsburgh in May of 1941? Right. And then how long were you in Pittsburgh for? for the Only overnight. And that, then how did you get to your next stop? They put me in, put us on a train. Um, was that all of the guys that were from Warren yeah, County? My, yes, all of us and, uh, well... I should say that I think that's right, but I'm not sure they could have diverted them elsewhere. I don't know, but they they put a whole bunch of us on there to on the train to go to Hattiesburg, where Camp Shelby was. That was a big camp in those days. Camp Shelby. Now, did you know that that's where where you were headed from Pittsburgh? Did yes, you know? we knew that. You knew that. And um, how long did it take you to get from Pittsburgh to uh, Camp Shelby? Well, I can't remember exactly, but it seemed like it's uh, it's, it's a Distance of, uh, well, it's, uh, it's probably like most of a day, I think. Because mm -hmm. we, we went, in those days, we went to Cincinnati and then south. Okay, so you went west and then south, mm -hmm. southwest. And then, um, and it was the train all uh, military, all, all uh, inducted? Uh, I think that's military. right. I, 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 is it my memory is that was correct. At Camp Shelby, um, had, when do you first recall the first military kind of experience, the uniforms, saluting, get up and go? Uh, well, of course, they checked us in and gave us uniforms and mm -hmm. and all that we had to have and uh, that we didn't get in Pittsburgh because uh, you couldn't wear any civilian clothes at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we were assigned our position. I was assigned to the service battalion for the 166th Field Artillery. Service. And and, I, and where you would sleep, I was, we had pyramidal tents, and we were assigned our tents and so forth. You were assigned tents to t tents right. to sleep in. Hold on, just a sec. So at Camp Shelby, had, did you uh, when, once you got in there, uh, your your quarters were where? You're recording. I was just wondering if it's off a little bit. Turn that's it. Oh, there you go. You see it now, better? There you go. Yeah. Uh, the, at Camp Shelby, you were you were describing the. You're, you're staying in pyramidal tents? Pyramidal tents, pyramidal yes. Pyramidal tents? We had uh, four cots to a tent. And they had a, had a stove in the middle of it uh, that burned soft coal. And yeah. uh, and with, uh, with a stovepipe out the top. And uh, soft coal had a lot of a lot of sparks. And we one of our tents burned right. While I was taking a nap, the tent, the tent burned out. Yeah. It was one of the dangers of, of, of that. Did they eventually construct uh, barracks? No, uh -uh. that was all tents the whole time I was there. Why? Why were you assigned to the? This is field artillery work, right? Well, I guess it's just luck of the draw. Uh, I had um, been to business college and I had uh, typing and uh, and had shorthand and uh, um, some accounting accounting courses, and I was assigned to the service battalion because they were the the supplier for the for the field artillery that that mm -hmm. unit. Mm -hmm. The was Camp Shelby basic training uh, for them. Uh, I guess uh, it was just complete training. Uh, they didn't have it divided up into basic training or whatever. I, I, I was just there and learning to be a soldier. Uh, what were your days like? This talk about what was it like. Uh, what time did you wake up? We had to wake up, uh, get out, and, and the, the the tents were like streets, and we had wood wood like wooden uh, sidewalks right outside of each side. In the middle was sand, and we had a stand railway in the middle of, in the sand. Uh, we had a first sergeant with the first tent coming back of Veteran Street, and he always held reveille. We got up about uh, five thirty every morning. And we'd have to shave and shower and and uh, get out there. We wouldn't stand stand uh, reveille, and then we went to breakfast. 
and then we went to work. What kinds of things were you doing in the first weeks that you were there? What do you recall for your training? Well, then we were, at that point we were learning to, to to march and learning the routine of regular everyday life in, in the army, and learning something about uh, army military um, rules and and regulations. And they were teaching us about just plain living in the army and what, what things were available to you, and what you would be probably not. Uh, you shouldn't be doing. And then uh, as we got that done, then I moved over, over into the, the office of the uh, service battalion and began to learn. I was just keeping records on uh, all of our equipment and uh, uh, getting supplies and uh, the whole thing for running the, our, ba our battalion. Mm -hmm. What time frame is this in 1941? This is uh, it was from May 5 until uh, I, I went through uh, war being declared. And I remember on that, that day, I told you earlier, I, I decided mm -hmm. I was going to do something about it. <clears throat> but I then I did uh, go for the Air Force and uh, applied to the Air Force. And I must have been accept, accepted and, and left, feel, uh, left the 166 six well I graduated from flying in April and it was a nine month course so backing it up it would be probably the middle of the year mm -hmm. in, in 1942 now, 1941 you're you're uh, mostly you've gone through basic training or training and it's a focus on field artillery work, right 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 so you're working in a battalion headquarters area right are you doing a, any real uh, actual uh, manning the artillery itself, or you're doing no. I was all I was doing was the, the, the booking part. The, the, book, the booking part. Booking part, yeah. Yeah, and your time off during that time. Um, what did you do on your weekends? What What do you recall? Well, I was a buck private um, for most of the time. I made PFC. We didn't have much money. Uh, we would go down to Biloxi and uh, and even into uh, New Orleans. We could save up enough to do it, but most of the time the weekends were just uh, spent resting and going to PX and going to movie, mm -hmm. and that was a routine. Now, December seventh, nineteen forty-one. That uh, your camp Shelby. How did you hear about the attack on the United States? The radio. The radio. At this point, had you been thinking about making a change in terms of your your? No, military? because. I, uh, no, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, no, b because I felt like at that point that I still had the option of perhaps of getting out in a year. Mm -hmm. But then that disappeared at that point, so I knew that I had to then decide something about doing, making career, some, improving myself some way. Mm -hmm. And I had heard from my, the guy who slept in the cot next door to me that uh, he had found out somewhere that we could go to the Air Force and uh, the Air Force would accept, if they accepted us, then the field artillery had to let us go. So that is what we did. How did you apply for the Air Force? How did you, how did I that? I cannot remember. Okay. And they, and you, you got word that they had accepted you into the, into the program and field artillery let you go. And about what time of year was that? 19... That had to be uh, right about uh, maybe February or something like that. January, February. Where did you leave um, when you went to uh, from Camp Shelby? Where did you go to next? Well, before I left uh, the 166 Field Artillery, they were, they were moved to uh, a, a brand new camp right out Camp Sutton, I think it was, right outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. So actually, when I left, and it was we were one of the first units in there. When I left, I left from from uh, Camp Sutton. Mm-hmm. Where did you head to? Well, I was given some time off to go home, mm -hmm. and uh, I took my first airplane ride. I'd never been in an airplane, and I knew I was going to have been accepted in the aviation cadet system if I could pass the tests. And uh, I got a friend of mine who was a pilot, and uh, had, he had a little, little Cessna, and I asked him to take me for a ride, which he did. And I got sick as a dog right away, and I 
the name's Lloyd Porter, and I said, Lloyd, keep me back on the ground as fast as you can. And he said, don't mess up my plane. And he got, got me back on the ground. I laid on, on, the, on the grass for a long time, then I went home, and I, my mother asked me how I felt. I said, not so good. And she said, you think you're going to fly an airplane? I said, I'm going to try the best I can. <laughs> and uh, I did I did go back then, of course, and get into the, the, the selection process and so forth. Well, what got your, what got, you heard about flying. You heard about the opportunity to join the Air Force, and that just, you thought that that was a better opportunity for you than staying yes, in the I did. Artillery. Yes, I did. I felt it was a good opportunity for me, and even though I, even if I couldn't get into flying, I would, I would be in the Air Force, and I could, I felt, have a more chance at improving myself in, in that branch of service. You didn't know, uh, no real previous desire to be a pilot up until that no. that, oppor that, that opportunity no, stuck, no, no, right? No. And uh, when you went home on leave, your friend took you up in a Cessna. How did that? How did you arrange that? How did that? Well, he's a friend of mine. I just called him up and asked him if he'd give me a ride, and he said certainly. So I went went down to Warren, where he kept his plane, mm -hmm. and, we, and we took a ride. And that was not a happy experience that no, first ride. No. I really felt that probably I would not be anything having to do with flying. I'd probably have a ground ground job with the Air Force or Air Corps in those days. After your leave, where where were you then uh, told to report to? San Antonio. How did you get to San Antonio? I trained. Were you by yourself? Yes. Did you have to make many stops to get before you got? You know, to San I can't Antonio? remember, um, but I took took the train by myself. By that time, though, I'd been coming back and forth from. Home from uh, uh, from um, Shelby, so I'd had quite a lot of experience going by myself and on the train system. Was it a good train system? Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, pretty good train system. So you got I to think better than today. That's unusual, but that. Ah. well, you would know. I mean, yeah. having had the opportunity, right? The the uh, San Antonio. Where where did you arrive in San Antonio? Did the Aviation you... Cadet Cadet Center. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that. What what was that experience like? First of all, tell me your rank when you get to the Aviation Cadet Center. I was a private first class. Mm -hmm. And this is in San Antonio. Right. Then they then they gave you the rank of avi once once you were accepted, they gave you the rank of Aviation Cadet. What time of year is this in 1942? That had to be uh, uh, in, around uh, July. The, what, hap what happens at the Aviation Cadet Center? They, you, they just kept you there uh, and gave you the, these, these battery of tests day after day after day uh, to make sure that you physically and, and visually, because uh, your vision was very important, mm -hmm. uh, at least for a pilot. And they, uh, if you didn't have the vision, then they would give you tests for bombardier, navigator, and maybe there's some other... But those are three of the positions that you really were, the officers were, were, were geared for. What do you call about like the, the vision tests? What kinds of things did they? They made it. You know, it uh, fighter pilots had that real good vision. They were supposed to, you know, pick up enemy aircraft. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was one of the very very important things for a pilot, both both bomber and fighter, but fi principally for a fighter. And it wasn't so important for a navigator because navigator didn't, did his work uh, on de a desk inside the the, the, the plane. Uh, and navigator too, so mm -hmm. they had to have good eyesight, but not excellent eyesight. Were your days uh, up early, revelling? They're up early, still up. You know, four thirty, five o'clock, and uh, then they just kept you going all day and in. in uh, they kept you active, and, and you had to go through your tests when, as they, as they were scheduled. But in the meantime, you were marching, you were picking up trash, you were, you were peeling potatoes. You <laughs> had you doing everything. They didn't let you sit. They didn't take your naps. And, and then uh, that was probably for a period of like two weeks that you went through that. Then they decided where you were, what you were going to be classified as, and then they sent you into that training. What were you classified after those first I was classified as a, as a pilot. Classified as a pilot. And then what, what happened then? Well, I was sent to uh, the, the primary training school uh, with some of the other people 
that I met at the cadets select, selection uh, place. Where was that? Uh, that was at San Antonio. But uh, we were sent to uh, Foster Field, I mean, not Foster Field, uh, Cimarron Field, which was near Norman, uh, Oklahoma, in that area. Now this is this is to begin your formal pilot training. That was to, to to fly, learn to, to fly. To learn to fly. Well, now how far is uh, is Cimarron Field from from uh, San Antonio from from where you were? Do you remember? Oh, I don't remember. How'd you get there? We had by train. I always travel by train. Train. Mm -hmm. And was this train? Do you remember? Was it all cadets? Was, uh -huh. was it all the, the air cadets? Right. The pilots. Army. Um, it was all army. Um, Military, I should say. Military folks. Some were cadets, some were other services. Describe this airfield that you've got to get to in Oklahoma. What's that like? It was a, uh, it was just a nice, a nice a small airfield. Uh, uh, the barracks were nice and clean, and uh, it wasn't a big place. The uh, field was was grass field, and we flew P P T nineteen planes, which were. Low, single wing, low, and uh, two co two uh, cockpits, front and back, one from the other. From the time you 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 flew in a Cessna, and you got airsick, to the time you you climbed into a P nineteen, had you flown? No. So, describe your feelings as you you're getting into this P nineteen. Well, I was just P19. hopeful that I could that I could fly without getting sick, and uh, of course I didn't. That didn't happen. I got sick and uh, once you got sick uh, you you had to come when you came down from that flight you had to go in the area because a lot of people got sick not just me you'd have to go in the area where you could hose the, the plane down uh, so when you got in an area everybody knew that you'd been sick but I kept getting sick and uh, came, became a regular um, member of the place to clean up the airplanes until my my instructor who was a very nice guy uh, got me aside and he said Landon he said you can fly but I can't you can't fly and be sick and he said you unless you want to walk through this airplane uh, to walk through this war you've got to cure that and uh, I said I know and I wish I could he said well I'm going to cure it for you he said I want to show you how how good this plane is because you worry not to think you're getting sick worrying about the airplane. He said, Tomorrow I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this airplane. Well, all, everything will do. We'll dive, we'll, we'll spin, we'll uh, do circles, we'll do everything. So I thought, Well, I'm not. So I thought, Well, I'm not. I didn't eat any supper. I didn't eat any, any breakfast. And I got in a plane when we, at the proper time, right after breakfast. And uh, he's, he, we started flying and uh, straight and level, we did nothing. But we flew straight and level and we went to, they had an auxiliary field where probably uh, 10, 15 miles away from the main field where they practiced landing. And he landed and he said, well, you're going to solo today. So he got out and I took off and I really, uh, the ground was all, all laid out and mile squares out there and I flew around, flew around and I knew I had to come down, but I did come down and uh, and I I ground looped the airplane. That means that the airplane just goes in circles, I mean real tight circles and usually the engine stops and sometimes it, the one of the wings will hit the, the ground. The reason it happens is that you're used to the instructor having his feet on the on the pedals and the, it's so loose that when you land you over you move them too much. Oh. And that's the cause of it. And uh, but uh, I thought that I would not get another second chance, so I was ready to get out when he came out. He said, and he had he had to pull the airplane had to be started by pulling a prop. And, and uh, he said, I'm gonna pull a prop through, and uh, I want you to take off again. I'm gonna you're, I'm, you're gonna kill yourself, but I'm gonna watch it. So I came in the next time and ground looped again, and. Uh, I was so sure that that would do it that I, then I got out and started walking off the field and he came and grabbed me and he said, get back in the plane. He says, you're going to do it today. So the third, third time that I did, I landed fine. Everything was fine. I didn't get sick and uh, everything was fine.
So. And when you say the third time, you didn't ground loop it? I didn't in? ground loop the third time. You just brought it straight in? Right. You were able to adjust it and bring it in right. the way you needed to. And I knew that it was the fact that I didn't. Was that the end of, the, was the end of your air sickness for you at that point? It was. It was the, it was for me, but uh, I got actually got sick coming home from combat. It was just, I think it's important that I had my mind, when I was busy flying, I didn't get sick. Mm -hmm. But all I had to do was sit and ride in a plane and I'd get sick. Not anymore, I don't know what, what it was I went through, but I flew home from combat and uh, I got sick uh, mm -hmm. coming home and I had saved some money. Um, Mr. Landon, you were talking about getting air sick uh, coming back from combat and you said you didn't have any problems with it. After that, there was no, that, it was just the only no, time, one time in, in combat? In flying combat, I didn't get sick. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 uh, I, f I don't know what happened. I, I felt like that uh, when I was busy and my mind was busy and I was doing something, like driving the car as opposed to being a passenger. But I did go through that, and mm -hmm. later on I didn't get sick. I, I used to fly all, all I want to now, and it doesn't bother me a bit. Doesn't bother you at yeah. all. Yeah, you said your your first instructor there at, at Cimarron Airfield. Yes, he was a. That was a, that was a civilian plane, or civilian field, and a civilian instructor. How many times had you been up in the plane before he ordered you to solo? How many times had you flown with him? Well, uh, I've, I, he only had one instructor. He, he stayed with you the whole time you were there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had been up with him a number of times. Um, I probably had uh, as much as 10 hours in the air or something like that about that before I, served, uh, before I tried to solo. What did he see in you that you were concerned you might not have seen in yourself at the time? You were obviously concerned you were going to wash out, I think, with I, being I, sick. I was, I was. Yeah. And he, I don't know, he he stuck me aside and said, you know, you can do it, mm -hmm. but you've got to do it yourself. And it's good that uh, it gave you confidence to be able to land that plane on your own and, and, to, uh, and to get up and do that. Now, um, how long were you at Cimarron Airfield uh, learning to... Be, to to you solo to have beyond the soloing, do you remember? I I think I think we spent a total probably uh, two and a half months, and probably I soloed. Uh, I, I probably I stayed after I soloed uh, as long as a uh, month and a half, something like that. What were you doing during that? After that, just soloing, you were just taking the plane up and flying it, right? Just learning how to fly. Did they have specific instructions for you as you were learning to fly? Well, they, every time that they, they would they, they would teach us maneuvers like uh, the chandelle, spinning, looping. Uh, that, that's what they taught us. Describe a loop. What is looping? Looping is just going in a circle, going up and around, come back like an old big O. Mm -hmm. Do you go upside down? Yes, at the, the top of the loop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that, that I thought was really going to bother me then. And I didn't. That was not a thing I loved to do, but I could do it. But you did it. Yeah. Now, was it, what's the difference between flying in a PT nineteen and flying in a Cessna? Describe that. What was that feeling like going from? Well, the Cessna, flying? we just flew straight levels. Cessna was a smaller plane than PT nineteen, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it was PT nineteen was a much nicer plane. I thought, even though it was two open cockpits as opposed to uh, an enclosed, the Cessna had enclosed. Uh, cabin. The uh, after the and after you soloed, that was it. You were soloing all the time at yes, that point. Yes, right. And, t and he was t and they were teaching us maneuvers. Then we go up and practice the maneuvers. Then they would give a final evalu flight evaluation to make sure we learned the maneuvers and could do them. And that and then you could pass to the next phase, which was basic training. Now, when you were learning to do the maneuvers, how were they communicating the maneuvers to you in the planes? There's a speaker between the two seats. Oh, I mean, so he would fly up there with you and right, say, do this, do right. that, do this. Then he'd send you up to, to practice them. Mm -hmm. And then after, uh, after your maneuvers, uh, what, what was your level there? What, was, what were you certified as at that point? A pilot. As a pilot. What happened after that? What was your next step after the, after the maneuvers? We went to basic then and... Uh, that was a step up in the the size of the airplane, 
Uh, we went to B, BT-13s, they were called. B as in boy, BT? Yeah, B and then like T, like Thomas. BT-13s. Now, why, what, what is basic? What does that mean? What's the difference? Well, that was, basic was just a step in the power of the airplane and uh, one step larger airplane moving towards the ultimate, whether it be bombers or, or fighters. Mm -hmm. And we, in, it, and we, in that, we learned all of the same maneuvers Started a little, little formation, not much. Uh, it had fixed uh, wheels. You, the wheels you couldn't bring the wheels up like you, you could. From that point on, we had airplane that the wheels that were retractable. Um, but the base, the it was called a beat of Valti, Valti vibrator. I think they called it. That's a nickname. <laughs> yeah. It had a lot of vibration when it strained when the engine strained. But it was a good airplane. It was a covered two seats, but it had canopy over both seats. Uh, this instructor sat in the back, and uh, they had a, we had a like earphones, of course, and he talked to us through the radio system. Taking me back to Simran Airfield, how long were you there for? A couple months, did you yeah. say? And what did you stay in in Simran Airfield? What we had um, barracks. Stayed in barracks. And how about um, basic? Was that also at Simran? No, that was uh, uh, that was at Coffeeville, Kansas. Coffeeville, describe Coffeeville, Kansas. It had just been put together. It was uh, winter uh, during the winter months. It was it was still winter when I got there? It was muddy, messy, and uh, we had barracks, new barracks, not quite as nice as the first the uh, first place I was. But we, uh, we, it was fine. It was about late 1942? You know, I'm trying to remember. It was, it was cold when I was at Coffeeville. But uh, I know I've looked through my things and I have no dates. Well, the only date I had was on one of the items that we, we had. Uh -huh. But I graduated in April 1943. So maybe Coffeeville was... Uh, Probably, I guess, in the winter of uh, 1942 and three. Winter 1940, 42, Maybe late fall, 40, 42. Now, when you're taking basic uh, training again, some of the some of the highlights of basic uh, at Coffeeville, what's going on there? What kinds of things are you doing? We just moved up in uh, larger airplanes uh, um, and moved forward and doing some a little bit of uh, formation flying and. Uh, just more sophisticated flying, learning learning how to handle the bigger planes and bigger planes. Mm -hmm. And and your instructor and the maneuvers in those planes too. Maneuvering in those planes. The instructors there were military. Military instructors. But they again they well you got one instructor when you reported in, and that instructor followed you through throughout your training at that station. Did anyone ever have, have problems with instructors or instructors with? Yes, them? they did. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, Sometimes they would switch instructors if there was a conflict between the the student and the and the instructor. But but all too often the instructor would usually if you had a conflict you, you probably would leave mm -hmm. because the instructors were supposed to be good and they're supposed to know uh, how to do the training. Mm -hmm. And if you weren't couldn't fit in the system, it just uh, I'd go better do something else. Mm -hmm. The Coffeeville, Kansas, and is it is it just called Coffeeville? Is it a camp there? Is it? Uh, it was Coffeeville Air Coffeeville Air Force Base. Air Force Base. Okay, Coffeeville Air Force Base. After basic, uh, what happened next? They sent sent us to Foster Field, Texas, which was at Matagorda, Texas, right on right on the Gulf. Foster Foster Airfield, did you say? Mm -hmm. Foster, Foster, they just called it Foster Field. I think that was, it was a, it, it was just Foster mm -hmm. Field in those how, days. How did you get there? Again, train. Train. Now, is this with the same group you've been training with? Well, part of the at basic, they made a deci decision whether you were going to fly, fight fly fighters or whether you were going to fly, fly uh, uh, bombers. I mean, whether you're multi multi engine. Or single engine, so the single engine people went to Foster Field, and the multi engine went somewhere else to train. How was that decision made? 
uh, the instructors made the decision on your how how you flew and and how they evalu evaluated you. Was it uh, what did, did people prefer to be fighter pilots as opposed to? Well, yes, they did. Um, they did for a couple of reasons. We we uh, everybody the freedom of being a fighter pilot was was desirable because you you were by yourself. You could do somewhat what you wanted to do, and what you did was on your own. You weren't responsible for, in a, in a bomber you had probably ten people that you were responsible for. You didn't have the leeway of, once you set your course, in the, in the bomber course, you had to follow the lead bomb, bomber and you had to do what, what whatever that bomber did, which meant going through, if once you set, once you set your course, the strafing could, they'd pick you up with a strafing from the from the ground and they would just send it up and where you're going to fly through. So the, some strafing tracked the plane and tried to get it in the air by tracking it. But most of it was just concentrated and they just sent it all up and you had to fly through it. So by by going through it, you, you, you would, they just automatically hit a lot of, of uh, bombers. The, uh, the idea of being a... So the idea of being a bomb pilot Really wasn't that wasn't as attractive as being a fighter pilot yeah. to me, yeah. and I think I was, you, I was just the same as everybody else. Yeah. The uh, what happens at Foster Field? What goes on there? Where, where you? Where well, you that going? then we got the first airplane with retractable wheels. We uh, did the cross countries. Uh, we learned navigation. Uh, we learned a lot of maneuvers, and we got more into. Uh, the early early dog fights and that sort of thing. All right, navigation and cross country. Describe a little bit about cross country flying. What's that all about? Cross country flying is you uh, you you fly to certain destinations and then back. Usually it was a triangle. You'd have to fly to some city and then and then uh, another city and then come back home. How did you? We usually did it visually. Visually. Were you given? Were you told that this is where you had to go? Yes. Were you told that you have to find your way there? Yes. And did you fly in formation? No, we're single. We did everything single. You flew on your own. Right. And and how did they know that you did this? Were you with your instructor? Were you on your they own? had uh, scouts out in there in individual airplanes, kind of look and see what you were doing. So they they kind of monitored you from another airplane. Mm -hmm. Along the way, they'd have these. Playing the station to see what you're doing. Now, at, from Foster Field, can you give give me an example of flying in a triangle to like three different points that you'd have to find? Uh, I I can't, but uh, but there were like three cities or towns. Okay. And uh, two cities. It was a triangle. We would find one city and then find another one and then come home. And we were not doing anything. We we're not. Doing flying uh, uh, except by visual, visually, and like they used to say, follow rip, tr railroad tracks. Yeah, and that's what we had to do because we we weren't uh, cleared uh, for uh, um, instrument at that point. We were we we became cleared for instruments right right after we left Foster Field, but we weren't at that point. When they tell you to look fly visually, are you, do they tell you before you go what to look for, or how do you figure no, it out? No, we have a map. We have a map that we we would draw a line on the map as to where we're going and and the, and the direction that uh, uh, we should go with it. You know, the heading. And uh, it, but that didn't take any in, into any consideration of wind or anything like that. So you had to have an idea of what you're passing over, so you could. See what you were going over the whole trip, and what the city, where the city was, and so forth. It was quite easy, really. Now, when you when you got back from uh, the the cross country flying, how how long were you at Foster Field? Do you recall? Well, I left there uh, when I got my wings at uh, April twenty first, uh, nineteen forty three, and I uh, I'm sure we were there about three months. It was about three months each place. When you received your wings, what does that certify you as? Uh, a pilot. Pilot. The, the, uh, and learning to fly on instruments. Did that happen after you got your wings? We did. I think we did a little bit, but not. not we didn't. 
we never did any instrument work, uh, but we had Link Trainer, which we uh, had had to spend time in, and which was a simulated uh, instrument flying, mm -hmm. and we had to do that uh, at beginning on the, at, at the advanced school Foster Field, and it continued all the way through. So mm -hmm. even when you when you, you joined your unit, you had to spend so much time to. Uh, the link, tra link trainer. Spell that for me. L A N. I think it's L I N C. L I N C trainer. And that's also for uh, for learning to use uh, instrument instrument training. Right. Then once we got really in in fighters, they uh, they would they would check, make us to do instrument training and and, and at advanced tra training. Uh, at the fast school, they would put us in the air with a, with a with a kind of a, 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 a something over our head, so we couldn't see what we were doing, but we could hear. And then the instructor would be in the back seat to make sure we did didn't kill ourselves, and we would fly uh, on instruments. Jeez. With the can, you could see the instruments, but you couldn't. They they'd take the canopy and black it out, so you couldn't see outside the canopy. A good way to learn how to, yeah. how to be trained on that. In those days, you uh, it's sophisticated today, but in those days you would bracket the the beam where you had a certain noise in the middle of the beam, and when you got the any edge, why well, you'd soon know that you're either on the right side or the left side, and then you'd get back, like going walking up a road and going from ditch to ditch. Mm -hmm. And is the beam designed to keep you right on track? Is it was that, yes. And is it it's something you hear or see? You hear. hear. You hear the beam. And is that because there's a, st a fixed point at some spot where there's right. a... Right, it's beaming out to you. There's a, there's a signal. Correct, it's beaming out to you. It's beaming out Then you'd you. follow that beam till you took another beam if you needed to, mm -hmm. to go any further. Mm -hmm. Now, when uh, after you, f you, you got your wings, where were you assigned to then? Where did, where did you go after that? Uh, I got my wings and... Um, I was assigned to Richmond Army Air Base, but I had to go to New York first. They sent me. They looked like the Army didn't know what they wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. They sent me to uh, Mitchell Field, mm -hmm. and they said, "Well, we don't need you here." So finally, I got. They sent me here at Richmond. That was to check out the P-47s, and I joined the 361st. All right, the P-47s. Uh, was that the first time you flew a P-47? Right. Tell me about the experience of going from a trainer, uh, a BT-13, um, and, and your other training to flying in a P-47. What's that like? Well, it was it was like going from a Volkswagen to a truck. Why? It was the, That was the biggest fighter they had in World War II. It was a mammoth thing. It was like a tank. We had, uh, it was a heavy aircraft, a radi radial, in radial engine. Uh, we had four caliber 50 uh, guns in each wing, leading edge each wing. Mm -hmm. um, it was a real powerful uh, aircraft. It had one fault, it had, they called it compressibility, that if you got to going too fast you, you couldn't, you couldn't control it. And the, the controls were frozen. And uh, we lost it, so they didn't want you to dive with it. That, that is, it was, that was a dangerous part. You had to be careful. Uh, if you got going too fast, and it was such a heavy plane, it would go down. Just to put it in the, in the dive, it just really, you know, go fast and <laughs> go like an arrow towards the ground. Mm -hmm. So we were still battling that problem. Although they corrected a lot of that uh, as we went along, but that was one of the problems. But I learned how to. Dude. So, uh, so I had learned uh, learned how to fly the, the P forty seven, and was mostly just getting used to the plane. Although we did dog fights, flew formation, uh, we just learned to fly the airplane, and only spent a little while here. That was uh, here in Richmond. in Richmond. That was right. in Richmond. Right now, and again, your train, you travel back and forth from Coffeeville. Was that by train as well? Did you train back over to here? Uh, well, I went um, I went home for a few days, and I picked up. I had a car. I picked that up and drove that back here. Mm -hmm. First to New York and then back down here. You had a car and you had that. The uh, 
Describe, because the, the P-47 is what you're going to fly for quite a while now. Right. Right? Describe the cockpit of a P-47. What's that like? Well, the cockpit was, a, of course, a single person in there. Um, it had the co it had the controls on the left hand, by your left hand, left hand, and also the, uh, not only the controls for the engine, um, but also the controls to bring up your wheels and put that down. Uh, it was right under the, th the throttle. And of course you had all the controls, that is a, the instrument panel in front of you. You had a, uh, in the middle of the instrument panel you had uh, a gun sight, which was a, uh, you could look, it had a round, it like a, when you look through it, it, uh, it, it had a round white, big round white with a dot in the center, and that you used to gauge uh, your shot wherever you were going to, where you going to shoot. We didn't. Uh, we did shoot a little ground gunnery uh, while we were here. That when we checked the air into the air, but we did a lot of it later on. In but we did a lot of it later on in the training. Mm -hmm. And we left. We left here probably after a month, and um, went to Langley Field where we first operated as a unit. And Colonel Christian, well, he was a, I think a major then, was a, our commanding officer. And um, uh, Major Cavanis was, was my squadron commander. This is the 361st Fighter s Squadron Group? What's it called? 361st Fighter Group. Fighter Group. Of which there were, it was headquarters, unit, and then there were three squadrons. 374th, 5th, and 6th. And what were you? So three, three, three seventy six. And uh, Christensen was the com was the commander of the of the whole group, and of the three seventy six, Major Cavanis was my commander. Mm -hmm. uh, how long were you at Langley for? Well, at Langley, uh, we uh, probably from Langley we we went and shot gunner at Millwood, New Jersey. And I expected we were landing for probably three months, and then we went to Millville for another three months. And uh, after we finished Millville, I got, it was in July, and I got some time to go home. So that's what I... That would have taken you to about July of 43? Right. Now, in, uh, in, in at Langley, you're learning to fly the P-47 as a, as a unit? With right, unit, right. Units? We did formation flying, uh, combat, uh, dogfight. I, uh, the man that uh, was my lead flight leader was, uh, had been a pilot with uh, the Royal Air Force. Uh, he joined over there early before we were in war and uh, flew with the Royal, Royal Air Force and then came back to uh, our Army Air Corps and was my flight leader. How about, you said you went to Millville, New Jersey? Yes. We went, went there to shoot gunnery. Describe that a little bit more. Well, we um, we shot fixed targets. We did dive bombing. We uh, would shoot in the air, and the way we did in the air, we would have one pot, one uh, one of our planes tow a, 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 a sleeve, and uh, we would shoot at the sleeve and our um, from the side. Uh, our our each each plane had different colored tipped. Uh, uh, ammunition so that when it hit the sleeve it would leave red or green or whatever so they could tell who had hit the sleeve. And we all had to take our turns at at, uh, at pulling the target. Because it was really good. You, you, you'd you be pulling the target and you'd see tracers going over your wings. <laughs> but I never heard of anybody get shot down. Get shot down. <laughs> the, the, the target was a little lower than the aircraft because of the had a long mm -hmm. tow thing mm -hmm. and uh, it dropped down because of, of just the weight of it. Did you, uh, uh, when you went over to Millville, did you fly from Langley to Millville? Or no, I drove, drove my car up. Did you fly? Well, some did. Some, some did. Some did. Did you fly in separate P-47s here in Millville? Is that what you had to do? Uh, there, in other words, there was a you weren't assigned a plane of your own, No, right? we were never assigned until we got to combat. Until you got to combat. Um, 
So this would take you through the summertime of uh, right. learning, of flying in formation, of learning and flying as a group. Right. What, what are your days like? Again, you're up early. We were up early. We uh, went to the flight. If we always went to the flight, uh, uh, our, our our squadron headquarters, and we then then were told us how to when you could fly and where you're going to fly and so forth. And we we sat in the ready sat in the ready room until we flew. And then when we came back, we probably we, we would sit around there to fly again, maybe. Mm -hmm. The uh, the amount of work that you're doing is it's constantly it's working with the group, learning everything about flying, right. and is as as this squadron. That's right. right. Yep. Um, and operating as a unit. And operating as a unit. What happens? Uh, what happens after Millville and, and Langley? What's next? Well, then we uh, went back to uh, we went to Camp Camp Springs, which is you now Andrews Field, right outside of Washington D.C. Okay, we were sent there to uh, guard <laughs> guard the, the capital, and uh, we flew combat uh, again flew uh, uh, guarding the capital. We couldn't go over the capital because you weren't supposed to, but we flew all around the capital and uh, every day and, and nights too. That must have been an interesting time. Yeah, it was. This is seen. One time I got over the Capitol and and uh, and I, there was bracketed by the by the, the, the searchlights. You know, man, I couldn't see a thing. <laughs> I got uh, my, the cockpit was so light it was night. You know, I turned, uh, got out to the right and got out of it. But after you got that close, they immediately bracketed you. <laughs> I had crossed close to the capital. And when you say bracketed, that means the the these the, the searchlights would zero in. All of them come from any direction, but they, they would come together on your plane. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you got out of there. I got out of there. You got out of there. But the, that's what we did at, at Andrews, and we were um, they called it camp. Uh, Said it just just said a while ago. Anyway, it was brand new. It had just been opened. Camp Springs, I think. Springs, right? Camp, Camp Springs sorry. was brand new. So, tell me then uh, about how long was this regarding the capital? Well, we uh, we uh, probably until October, and then we came back to Langley to wait to ship ship overseas. Okay. At this point, did you know where you were going? Yes, we knew we were going to England. And then we came back to Camp Shanks uh, and went over by boat, Queen, uh, Huey, uh, Queen Elizabeth. How'd you get to Camp Shanks? Uh, train. I sold my car before I left. So you're ready to go to Camp Shanks. Did you feel prepared? Well, to head to yes, combat? I, I, I certainly wanted to go with the, the, the people I'd, I'd gotten to know and work with and flown with. Uh, my father had fallen and broken his leg, ba leg badly, and uh, uh, I told my uh, the guy from the Royal Air Force, uh, Smitty, that he had had, had hurt, gotten hurt badly, and uh, Smitty later came to me and said, "Well, you can stay here if you want to. Uh, we I'd like for you to come with us, but he said we have we're overstaffed. We need to get rid of a couple people." So if you want to stay in the United States and see if we were close to your father, you can do that. And I thought about it. I didn't. I didn't. I said, "No, I'm going with you." So that's what I did. They, I don't know. They let a couple guys go, but I I went. You uh, to Camp Shanks. You took a train to Camp Shanks. Yes. And Camp Shanks is where is it located? New York. It's New York. Right outside the city. And then from there it was to what? What did you? We went to, um, we went to, um, to um, Scotland, mm -hmm. and then out of Scotland we went by train to Bodisham where we had the base. Now, the trip over, what was that like? Describe that. The, uh, it, was, it was very the uneventful. We, uh, was, the, the, the boat was crowded. Um, How crowded? All military. All military? How crowded was it? Well, I, can't, I think it was 5,000 on, on the boat. Where did you where did you sleep? 
I, we had we had a cabin. We had uh, I think slept three deep on 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 uh, uh, hammocks, and uh, it, was, it was it was okay. It was not great, but it was okay. What food was decent. Food was decent. Really? What time of year was it? Uh, that would be uh, November, November nineteen forty three. Do you recall any uh, special way you had to go get over there to Scotland? No, well, I, I worried. No, I worried about we were by ourselves. There were no escort. Uh, they said that um, they were fast enough so the, the subs couldn't. They could evade the subs. We had one scare on the way over, but we evaded and uh, got over there without any problem. At that time, uh, German subs were doing a pretty good job on uh, sinking, uh, particularly. Uh, Cargo ships, but we had no one. We had just uh, our ship, and we it was it was a great ship. Were there any regulations uh, enforced while you were traveling over uh, blackouts on the ship? Uh, anything that you recall that was? Uh... I didn't went on the deck. I'm, I'm sure that the, they they had the thing rigged so that you. Yeah, I never went on the deck. Did you have to wear a life vest the whole time? Yeah. Some people did. Okay. And you, uh, the, the ship arrived where again? It, um, it, in Scotland. And I mm -hmm. can't think of the name of the, of the, uh, of the, or the name of the port. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you went? We went by train to Bodisham, England. What is Bodisham? What exactly is Bodisham? Bodisham is a very little village. Uh, it's in between Cambridge and Newmarket, where the big races are in England. It's six miles both directions. It's twelve miles between there. That those two cities, and uh, we were Bodisham is six miles. Just a little tiny village. Great and place. It had a, a bakery there, I think, and uh, that's about all. We stayed at. A, we had we had uh, tar paper shacks outside of a large uh, home manor, English manor. Uh, we had uh, we had bicycles to get around. It's probably uh, at least a half a mile or more from where we were 